Part 1. 1. You are going to hear a conversation between an agent and a client. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Hello. Hi. Good morning. Are you open yet? Yes, we are. Come in. Would you like to rent an apartment in the city? Well, kind of. I'd rather rent one near the harbor if possible. Oh, okay. Do you like the water? Yes, I do. But I actually repair sailboats for a living. So I'd like to be close to work. That's understandable. We all want to live close to work. Well, I think I have something near there. How many rooms would you like? Just one. I'm alone. But I would like to have an extra room for my dog. So you'd like two rooms and an apartment that accepts animals. Hmm. Here's one. It's one block up from the harbor and renting for $445. How's that? That's perfect. Just what I was hoping to pay. What floor is it on? Floor? Oh, it's on the twelfth floor. That's too high. I'd like to be on the first or second floor so that I don't have to use the elevator. My dog, he's scared of them. Oh, well then, that's a little more complicated. Let me make a few calls. Okay, I think I found a couple more for you. Here's one that might suit your needs. How much? $395 a month. That's cheap. But it's only a one-bedroom, a large one, but it's still just one room. Oh. Well, regardless of whether the room is small, I still need a separate room for my dog. What else do you have? Then I have a two-bedroom for $565 on the second floor that is a little further away from the harbor. How far? About a half mile, and they accept pets. That's a little more than I had planned on paying but I guess I could look at it. What's the address? 224 Williams Avenue, Harbor Square. 224 Williams Avenue. Got it. Now look at questions 7 to 10. As the talk continues, answer questions 7 to 10. What else is included? Let's see. It has a washer and dryer, refrigerator and stove, a bed, dressers and shelves, and access to a swimming pool, game room, and gym. Ooh, I'll definitely take a look. Hi, how did you like it? It's great. I love the amenities, but the bed and furniture are awfully dirty. Can they replace those before I move in? Sure, that shouldn't be a problem. Anything else? Yeah. I didn't see anywhere to park my car. Is there a parking lot in the basement? Yes, there is. Would you like to rent a space? No, I'd like that to be included in the rent. Oh, well, I'll see what I can do, but I can't guarantee that. Do you want to take it anyhow? If those two issues were solved, I would love to take it. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a lecture on bird migration. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. My lecture this evening will focus on the migration of birds. That is, how birds fly in big groups from different parts of the world at certain times of the year. In the first part of the lecture, I'll talk about the reasons why birds migrate, when they migrate, and which parts of the world they migrate from and to. To start with, why do birds migrate? Well, there are two main reasons. One, they migrate to look for food. And two, they travel to parts of the world that are more suitable for breeding. In fact, these reasons are closely linked. As you can imagine, when birds are breeding, they need extra food to feed their young. And in the spring, in the cooler climates of Europe, there is a lot of food for birds, especially insects. So generally, during the spring, Birds fly up from the tropics, which are hot, to cooler climates in the north. They stay there for a few months to bring up their young. And then, when the weather in the north gets cold in the winter, they fly back to warmer climates in the south. Now I'd like to talk a bit about how global warming has affected bird migration. One of the effects of global warming has been to make the spring come earlier in the northern regions of the world. When spring comes early, the plants and insects that birds need to bring up their young are also available earlier. Research has shown that quite a lot of birds have started to migrate earlier because of higher temperatures. But unfortunately for some species, this hasn't been early enough. What I'm saying is that birds that are travelling a long way for breeding may arrive too late to find enough food to feed their young and their population drops drastically. Scientists are currently researching more about this. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. Now, I thought I'd finish by just briefly describing a few different patterns of migration. Uh, migration varies with the type of bird and the area they come from. For example, one kind of migration is partial migration. This means that some birds in a particular species will migrate and others won't. It usually depends on how the weather affects food supplies, and very often happens in the tropics. In another migratory pattern, a bird called an arctic tern migrates the whole length of the globe, from the North Pole to the South. The arctic tern travels between 12 and 15,000 kilometres each way when it migrates in a complete circle around the world. It's quite amazing. Right, and lastly, I'd like to mention a pattern which isn't nearly as spectacular, but is very interesting. And this is the way many birds migrate across North America. In this pattern, the birds fly northwards in the west of the country and then back south again in the east. So, if you imagine it, they're actually migrating in a circular pattern, like the hands of a clock, not in a straight line, as we might think. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a discussion between two work colleagues and their manager about the restructuring of their company. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Come in, both of you. I believe you wanted to talk to me about something, is that right? Yes. Basically, all the staff are concerned about what the restructuring of the company is going to mean for them. None more so than myself and Nam, as we are the newest members. Oh, as I said to all staff at the meeting last week, there's no cause for concern. There will be no compulsory redundancies. All redundancies will be on a voluntary basis. Yes, we, we understand that. But to tell the truth, we just want a little reassurance that our jobs are safe. Look, Anne and Penny, the company isn't going to be short-sighted and let its bright young minds go. Besides, we've already met our target for the number of voluntary redundancies we want to secure. In fact, there's a waiting list. You know as well as I do that the age profile of staff at this company needs to come down. A lot of our employees are close to retirement age and are just going through the motions until they can take their pensions. That's why we decided on this redundancy initiative. We want to encourage those that would be happy to leave to do so and employ younger, more motivated staff. I guess that makes us feel a little better. But we're also worried about the upcoming salary review. What will it mean for us? Given the fact that the company's motivation for this restructuring initiative is not to cut costs, one again, you needn't be worried that there will be a negative effect on your salaries. We are running a very profitable business and we will reward our top performers in the upcoming review. Both of you fall into that category so you can expect a healthy bonus and salary increase. Simple as that. That's good to know. Another thing on our minds was the fact that with all these voluntary redundancies happening in the next few months, there will be a lot of positions opening up higher in the company. What we were wondering is, will the recruitment drive be an internal or an external one? Obviously, we will recruit internally where possible. That has always been company policy. So, if you're asking me will there be opportunities to gain a promotion in the near future, then the answer is very definitely yes. The type of candidate we would be looking for has a proven track record and is performance driven. How can we improve our chances of getting promoted then when the opportunity arises? Well, in the meantime, be prepared to take on additional responsibilities, especially those relating to the management of other members of staff. Obviously, the higher up you go in the company, the more involved you'll be in managing people. What the management team is looking for then is proof that you can work effectively with and manage other members of staff. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. One more thing. Go on. This project you've given us to manage, is it a test of our abilities? I guess you could say it is a test of sorts, but look at it more as a chance for you to prove yourselves. Actually, now that I have you both here in private, can we talk about that a bit? Of course. OK. Penny. Let's start with you. Has the timescale been agreed yet? Yes. 
You said we have a total of eight weeks to bring the product to launch. So we've decided to allocate three weeks at the beginning to product research and prototype testing. Very good. Then after that, we are going to spend a further three weeks formulating our marketing strategy and doing some research and testing on a sample of the target market itself to get some feedback. And presumably the last two weeks will be devoted to the launch? Exactly. Now, let's talk estimated costs. Well, you've given us a total budget of £100,000. Of that, we're allocating 50% to product development and testing, a further 25% to marketing, and £25,000 will be spent on the launch. Penny, give me a breakdown of the launch costs, would you? Sure. £10,000 will be spent on hiring and decorating the venue, £10,000 will be spent on promotional work and the remaining money will be used to pay for catering and administrative costs. Uh, I'm very happy with that, to be honest. As I said, you guys should stop worrying. You're doing a fantastic job, so keep it up. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecturer in education talking about some experiments done in the USA to investigate the effects of reducing class sizes. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40 on pages 71 and 72. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. All over the world, there are passionate arguments going on about how educational systems can be improved. And of all the ideas for improving education, few are as simple or attractive as reducing the number of pupils per teacher. It seems like common sense. But do these ideas have any theoretical basis? Today, I want to look at the situation in the USA and at some of the research that has been done here in America on the effects of reducing class sizes. In the last couple of decades or so, there has been considerable concern in the United States over educational standards here, following revelations that the country's secondary school students perform poorly relative to many Asian and European students. In addition... Statistics have shown that students in the nation's lower-income schools in the urban areas have achievement levels far below those of middle-class and upper-middle-class schools. So would reducing class sizes solve these problems? Well, we have to remember that it does have one obvious drawback. It's expensive. It requires more teachers and possibly more classrooms, equipment, and so on. On the other hand, if smaller classes really do work, the eventual economic benefits could be huge. Better education would mean that workers did their jobs more efficiently, saving the country millions of dollars. It would also mean that people were better informed about their health, bringing savings in things like medical costs and days off sick. So what reliable information do we have about the effects of reducing class sizes? 
There's plenty of anecdotal evidence about the effect on students' behavior, but what reliable evidence do we have for this? Let's have a look at three research projects that have been carried out in the USA in the last couple of decades or so. The first study I'm going to look at took place in the state of Tennessee in the late 1980s. It involved some 70 schools. In its first year, about 6,400 students were involved, and by the end of the study, four years later, the total number involved had grown to 12,000. What happened was that students entering kindergarten were randomly assigned to either small classes of 13 to 17 students or regular-sized classes of 22 to 26. The students remained in whatever category they had been assigned to through the third grade, and then, after that, they joined a regular classroom. After the study ended in 1989, researchers conducted dozens of analyses of the data. Researchers agree that there was significant benefit for students in attending smaller classes, and it also appears that the beneficial effect was stronger for minority students. However, there's no agreement on the implications of this. We still don't know the answer to questions like how long students have to be in smaller classes to get a benefit, and how big that benefit is, for example. The second project was much larger and took place in California. Like the Tennessee study, it focused on students from kindergarten through to grade three, but in this case, all schools throughout the state were involved. The experiment is still continuing, but results have been very inconclusive, with very little improvement noted. And the project has, in fact, also had several negative aspects. It meant an increased demand for teachers in almost all California districts. So the better-paying districts got a lot of the best teachers, including a fair number that moved over from the poorer districts. And there were a lot of other problems with the project. For example, there weren't any effective procedures for evaluation. All in all, this project stands as a model of what not to do in a major research project. A third initiative took place in the state of Wisconsin at around the same time as the California project began. And it's interesting to compare the two. The Wisconsin project was small. Class sizes were reduced in just 14 schools, but it was noteworthy because it targeted schools at which a significant proportion of the students were from poor families, compared with California's one-size-fits-all approach. Analysts have found that the results are very similar to the Tennessee Project, with students making gains that are statistically significant, and that are considerably larger than those calculated for the California Initiative. Now, I'd like to apply some of these ideas to the later...